Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, for my second time, second year in a row. Always a pleasure to be back in uh, Tel Aviv uh, to speak on kids' technologies. And I work with uh, lots of companies in this space, including um, some of those here on this panel, and uh, have been exposed to uh, quite a few newer innovative uh, tech in the kids and family market, some of which might uh, raise, raise some eyebrows. So uh, the purpose of our panel is to talk about those newer technologies, um, how companies can continue to innovate in this space, uh, but more importantly, uh, what sort of uh, controversial issues do these new uh, technologies for kids raise, and how these co companies in particular, as well as some others, uh, what are they doing to address uh, those concerns? So we'll get right into this, and, and what I'd like to do is ask, ask each panelist to uh, tell us their name, their role, uh, the company they work for, and specifically the tech uh, that they are developing uh, for the kids and family market. And we'll start with uh, Avi Shai, uh, given... Hi, um, oh. my name is Avi Shai. I work for Pixanai. Um, I'm the, business, the director of business operations which means that I do also the business side of the of things, but also handling product and other operational uh, services that we that we perform. Pix and I created a platform to understand the consumer behind a mobile device, uh, specifically in apps, uh, specifically in only. Um, the way to understand the people's uh, lifestyle, we found, is through their uh, photo galleries. Uh, so before you go crazy, the answer is yes. Pixanai analyzes people's personal photo and video galleries in order to extract some very clever data completely anonymously, meaning all those photos become into numbers, into abstract numbers, and we extract some information from that. If people have kids, if they have a dog, and so on and so forth, including their lifestyle and behavior, or behavioral pattern, uh, preferences, hobbies, and so on. And that data is used for what, generally speaking? What do you use that data for? Well, understanding the consumer is, is not just something that is used for ad targeting. It goes uh, far beyond that. Uh, some of my clients use it for their own user experience uh, uh, capabilities inside their own app. Because once you understand who the user is, you modify and change your app accordingly. Okay, great. Thanks for the overview. I'll see you want to go next. Hi, I'm Asi Meskin. I'm a co-founder of Bohead Technology, which uh, we invented the first ever interactive water bottle for children. So basically, it's a water bottle that has uh, different sensors and capabilities, and it gamifies the uh, drinking uh, habit. It, it actually uh, encourages children to drink, and you have a little Tamagotchi uh, character pet that you choose once you set it up. And um, and then the more you drink, according to what you're supposed to drink daily, uh, the character develops and um, the game develops and you go through different worlds and so forth. And I, I don't know when you want me to like showcase it, but I could showcase it at uh, any point. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait for that. We'll Just wait for that. So basically, that's our company. What I do is I do business development and uh, I also work with content development, and I also look over uh, parts of the operation, specifically targeting the Western parts of the world. Great, thanks. We're also joined by Morris, who some of you have heard from already. Uh, Hi, I'm Morris Wheeler, um, strategy planning partner at Little Big Partnership. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a specific piece of amazing technology, but I uh, advise all my clients on their specific pieces of amazing technology. Um, so anyone from Google to Disney to BBC to um, uh, and anyone and everybody in between. So um, yes, I, I will advise my clients on how best to create an experience specifically aimed at kids and families. Okay, great. So we're going to go back to you, uh, Avi Shai, and uh, tell us, wh what are you doing with your solution that no one's ever done before? Um, a, B, uh, with a focus on kids and family. So I know that there's some interest uh, at your company in, in bringing this to the broader kids and family market. Um, and has your product been launched? So uh, those three things. One, what, have you, what are you doing that's not been done before, um, especially for the family and kids market? And has your product been launched yet? Well, what we do is we don't, um, since people today communicate and document their entire life on their photo album, 
um, the information that we extract from it becomes the real and genuine information about the user. Because today, when people want to understand who the user is, they require interaction from that user. Uh, some sort of a purchase, some sort of a click, or a survey, or fill this and fill that. Uh, that type of information can be sometimes misguided, can be incorrect. And sometimes if people feel something about the sel themselves, that still can be a little bit off from the truth because people think highly of themselves as well. So what we do, not only what the, the information we provide is genuine because it's user generated, it's also encompassing because it describes the entire user's lifestyle. Why? Because if you have a dog, you take a picture of your dog. And if you have a baby, you take a picture of your baby. And when you travel and your favorite food and your favorite, you know, when you go to the gym and you're a selfie when you're running and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right, um, Asi, let's go to you. Uh, tell us again what what is unique about um, the Galulu water bottle. Uh, what's never been done before, um, and uh, is it is it available yet on the market? Yeah. Um, so Galulu, what's unique about it is that a water bottle that is a smart connected device um, that can track the water intake of a child and at the same time interact with a gamified uh, pet and whole ecosystem around it because it's also interactive when two children shake two bottles one jumps to the other and they become friends on the app the parents can see that as well so it kind of um, pre cell phone age because we're targeting the ages three to ten it is a unique um, product because Something exactly like this has never really been done before. There are some, um, you know, in the past two, three years, there have been some smart water bottles for adults that will track um, how much an adult has drank, but nothing for children and nothing with a screen that can actually um, interact as well. So that's, you know, that's what's unique about it. Can you show the screen to the... Yeah. Okay. I don't know if everybody can see, but there's there's a screen there, and um, and then there's a little there's a little a pet. This pet is called Ninji. At this moment, we have uh, three pets. We have Sansa, which a lot of girls choose. We have Ninji, which has a little sword. So each pet has like a special power. And then there's sensors inside the bottle that um, calculate and and actually um, they they um, can learn the pattern of the child's drinking. So there's, you know, we see the level of water, but we also have an inclinometer that can see when it's being, you know, swayed to side to side and the water is moving inside. So we can actually track the pattern of the child. And then there are sensors on the side that interact with the actual pet. So let's say if I touch it like this, you see, I don't know if you can see that, but it does like little tricks. And then on this side, because children, you know, so... It also goes up and down. I don't know if you can see that. And, that, and when you shake it, it becomes dizzy. Sound. So there's also the really cool things. And then there's also, um, you know, the actual game itself. The way it, 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 it interacts with the child is that once you drink what you're supposed to drink, and we calculate this, I mean, we research this deeply, you know, we, we advise with scientists, and we also are basing our, our work on some vast studies that have been done by Harvard and so forth that have been published. And we calculate how much a child should be drinking every day. And if he reaches his daily goal, then he gets rewarded. And along the way as well, so the pet will grow and the game will continue and he will move to different worlds. So it's kind of like uh, gamifying a healthy habit and creating a healthy habit for a child from a young age. Because half the children in the U.S., I want to say this, this is important, half the children in the U.S. are dehydrated. They don't drink enough. Parents don't even, you know, maybe some of them are aware of it, but a lot of them don't even know how much a child should be drinking. And a quarter of the kids are diabetic because of sugary drinks. And this is the U.S. I mean, in other places in the world, it, it can even be worse. So that was the reason why we, we created this bottle, really from a you know, health perspective. and. Um, so Asi, can I can I put, fill that up with uh, Fanta red Fanta cherry soda and uh, um, still get rewards? Okay, so yes, you can put in you know any liquid that is not hot. If it's hot, the bottle will will detect it and and alert because there are 
electronic components inside of it. So I'm going to put like steaming water in it or coffee or whatever. But if you do put, you know, any sodas or things that are either cold or room temperature, it will treat them like any other liquid, right? But, I mean, from our point of view, since we are promoting water, right? And we believe that parents understand that need and the ones that purchase it are not the six-year-old kids, uh, they will make sure that they do drink water. We believe that that's the case and we see that right now. I mean, we're already in the market. Uh, we've, you know, Bezrat um, Hashem will only grow and, and you know, we, we've had a very successful Kickstarter now we're on Indiegogo, but basically what we're seeing is that parents are using it for water and I'll tell you something else. If the child, let's say, cheats, let's say he's a nine-year-old, you know, really smart kid, and he wants to put Coca-Cola, the parent's the one that's washing the bottle. You know, it's waterproof, obviously. So that's the parent control. So the parent will detect, and, and we'll go sick. like, yo, what's going on here, kid? Like, would you put Coke in here? You know, so... Do you have GPS? Ge no, uh, we don't. Geo okay, so that's a good question. And Shai, we're working with Shai, by the way, who is an awesome human being. Um... And uh, Shai is helping us because we are, we are, you know, as a toy company and especially as a, as a, as a product, right, which goes out to families and kids. There are a lot of compliance laws that need to be abided by, and it's part of why we're in this panel talking. So Shai is helping us. And GPS—that's a good question. A lot of parents want that because they say, "Wow, this is an expensive bottle. I mean, what if my child loses it? it loses many things, and you know, I don't want him to lose it." So how, we have, how expensive is it? Ninety-nine dollars, okay. right now. So basically, um, we don't have a GPS, and we can't have a GPS because, according to uh, laws in America, and I mean, Shai can can talk about this more than me. Um, you know, you're not really allowed to track children and where they are and so forth, and not put that info in the cloud. But we do have some partnerships in place. Meaning we, we kind of, you know, and that's something we should actually discuss. Uh, we want to throw that liability onto a company that's already doing that. And there are certain companies out there right now that that's what their expertise is. So what we can do then is partner. I mean, this is one of the solutions we're hoping to do. And if a parent, you know, wants to buy our bottle, he can buy our bottle. But if he really wants to add that uh, GPS tracking device, like on a suitcase or like on your keys, can do that. But then the other company is liable, not us. So I want to stay on this topic and I'll come back to Avishai more about data collection. Does that concern you? Does geotracking concern you? Or are you asking more from a, from a user experience standpoint? Well, we'll talk about some of the implications of tracking geolocation. Um, wh while we're on the topic of, of data, um, Avishai, let's come back to you and tell us, you, you've already talked some about what data you're capturing. Um, and how you're anonymizing yes. it. But if you could be more specific about what specific data are you capturing from the phone and then what are you translating that into? Well, it's very important to understand that no specific identifier ever leaves the phone, meaning uh, every every process happens on the phone itself using the phone's CPU and no photo is ever being seen or modified or changed or relocated or uploaded to the cloud. The entire processing happens on the device itself and the extraction of which is, is numerical values that we tr uh, understand as values. Uh, for example, estimation of age or probability if a person has a, like I said, a dog. And, and actually every aspect of lifestyle that you can think of that people today document through photos and each and every one of us has one, two, and three thousand pictures on, on the device. The information that we store, we use uh, with the Google ID, for example, which is the standard identifier today in the market, which is not only uh, generic and says nothing about the specific user, it's, it's also modifiable, meaning uh, every user can go into its own um, phone and reset it. And in this case, I'm losing the person. I don't know who the person is, and this uh, client does not exist anymore in my system. Um, no information is attached to those uh, profiles, meaning I don't know who the person is, their name, their any personal identified number that is, that is not changeable. Okay, and how and do you actually go and scan the photos on the device? I mean, in order to come up with the numerical values that you're yes. talking about, 
actually scan the photos. Well, it's not a scanning in the sense of someone sees the picture and then it turns out into an element. Uh, every photo has its own meta tagging and its own elements that come once upon you take the picture. For example, the geo stamp or the time stamp. These elements are taken as numerical values within the picture itself. And we condense the photo album on the device itself and then it transforms into numbers. Yeah. I hope that answers yes, your yes, question. Yes, thank you. Um, Asi, on the, the Galulu bottle, wh what data do you need about the child in order to make that a valuable experience? And how does it function? First of all, the most important part for us is, um, is the water consumption, right? So that's the, that's the you know, target, is to know how much a child is drinking. So in order to calculate how much he's supposed to drink, I need to know his weight. Actually, his weight is, is the most important part. The age, we ask for the birthday so that we know the age and we know the gender gender, gender as well. We ask for that. And, um, and then we ask for a name, but, you know, you know, following your advice, we're asking, you know, we want to ask for a nickname so that, you know, it's not a, like, my name is Asi Meskin, Asi Meskin, and now someone can, you know, God forbid, tap into my name, my info, get my, you know, get the email of the user, parents, through the, you know, through, in this case, iOS. Um, but we ask for a nickname, the birthday, the gender, and the weight. And then we can calculate how much he's supposed to be drinking. And that all integrates with the app. And by the way, the app can have a few children because, you know, obviously if you have more than one, then you want to have one app for, for all. How many of the people in, in the audience here would consider their weight to be sensitive data? Yeah? Okay. How about, how about your age? Not your age. And gender? No, okay. But your child's weight, would that be sensitive? Child's weight? Child's weight, and less sensitive, right? Yeah. Well, the truth is that all three of those data elements together are not sensitive. They're not even personal. It's only when it's combined with something else, like a name, right, or a street address, uh, or a photo that might show the child's face. But if I just know someone's gender, weight, and age, it's meaningless. There are a lot of people probably in the same bucket, um, within the same city, even, for that matter. So um, that's what's interesting about this. We, we talked about identifiers as well. Um, Avishai and Asi both mentioned that there's obviously some element of, of an identifier that's being associated uh, with the data that you're producing, which is pretty commonplace in the industry. Um, before I close on the topic of data, I, I want to come to you, Morris, um, and ask, you know, what other kinds of cutting-edge uh, digital products have, have you seen in the industry, um, you know, whether it's in the uh, augmented reality space, uh, robotics, connected toys, anything you've seen sort of cutting-edge that has also involved some unique uh, forms of data collection? Um I kind of mentioned it earlier. I think that we may now get to the point where you can kind of do everything and anything. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think there's some really interesting, you know, Pokemon Go, obviously everyone will talk about Pokemon Go because it's the hot topic, but I think there's a lot of data that um, that some parents are rightfully concerned about. Um, you know, we're looking at um, how audiences react to virtual reality, um, and that can obviously be quite sensitive. Um, I think in the... I think one of the interesting areas is actually probably around the amount of information that parents are willing to give about their children. Um, so one of the areas, particularly, obviously a lot of the technology that's um, around today um, is is actually aimed more at parents than it is at the children. So particularly around things like educational apps, um, where a parent perceives that there is some potential educational value to an app, a parent will give away a lot of information um, and potentially will give away more information than they would if it was felt that it was a more of a, an entertainment app. So I think there's an interesting um, discussion around education of a child and the amount of information and personal information you would give away for that means, uh, whereas you wouldn't necessarily give away the same amount of information for a more entertainment-driven um, uh, proposition. <clears throat> um, I think it's, uh, I think they're all they they can all be very sensitive. You know, I think AI is probably the one that 
that is probably most scary. <coughs> Uh, I mean, we've seen things like Hello Barbie, um, and um, that's obviously had some security breaches in in kind of some information that was taken. Um, I think that's a really fascinating area is is that whole artificial intelligence and the sort of information that children are giving to these artificial dolls. So I don't know if you know Hello Barbie, if you kind of know that area, but obviously you can have a full conversation with um, with a doll and um, you tell it private and personal information uh, and it stores that and it remembers that and it recalls it. So to the point where, you know, with, with Hello Barbie or, or any of the other ones that are on the market at the moment, um, she will ask you what's your favorite thing to do and you might say well i really enjoy horse riding and then maybe in two or three months later hello bible will ask you how you're feeling and you say well i'm feeling quite sad and she will say well maybe you should try horse riding because you really enjoy horse riding so there's a lot of personal information and i think one of the challenges is, is that we can all see the huge benefit from a uh from a technology perspective of the barbie doll remembering that and also we can we can see some huge values to the child of the Barbie doll remembering that. But I think sometimes we we kind of look... Sometimes we forget that actually this information might not be useful to the user. And actually we might be using technology just for technology's sake. Um, and we might go, well, we could find that out. And I think it's really interesting here because there's a lot of stuff that you guys could know. And actually it's only... A switch away from going well i could you know i could find out the geolocation of the wi-fi network that it's hooked up to and i could find a little bit more information about the audience but we choose not to um and so i think that's a it's a really interesting time that we're in where there's a lot of information that um that we could have access to that that we're at the moment thankfully i think a lot of people are choosing not to but um well what's but, what's, yeah. what's noteworthy about the example you gave and i can give another example as well um in the case of hello barbie so Hello Barbie, the way that works, um, and now there's also uh, a new product called uh, um, Hello Barbie Dream House, which is a dollhouse playset, which you can converse with and it talks back. Um, but what's interesting is that the the information that Barbie might capture, like, uh, do you like you know horse riding, um, or you know how many siblings do you have? That's not the data that's considered personal. What the data that's considered personal is the child's voice recording. Just the child's voice recording. Even if you don't know who that child is um, or can identify that child based on their, their audio, based on their recording, that's the piece of data that's considered personal, uh, at least as far as regulations are concerned. So, um, but we'll come back to that and we'll talk, we'll talk some, some about that too. Um, I want to ask one quick question because sure. we are looking to advance to AI as well and for our pets to be able to detect what makes the child happy. Like, for example, if he does a little trick it will make the child happy. But it's not a voice thing. It's more of a, like the child will laugh or react in a, in a way that will sh teach the pet that this is making the child happy. So when he's sad, he's not going to tell him, hey, go horse ride. It'll actually do this trick. But that's something that's not. Well, it, I mean, there are ways it could be done. There's a, there's a new product uh, out from a company called Anki. Uh, anybody know about Anki Drive? It's a race car. Uh, an artificial intelligence uh, race car track uh, controlled by an app. Uh, and you can have two cars on a track racing and fighting against each other and shooting each other down. Uh, so they just re released a new product called Anki Cosmo. Uh, it's a robot um, which plays games with you. So you have the app and there's a you know robot, looks like a little bit of a truck. Uh, and there are uh, these blocks. And you have a competition with the robot on who can tap the blocks Faster, you on the app or the robot with its with its uh, with its tools. Um, so it's pretty neat. But what's interesting about Anki is that it also will remember the face of the user. So it will scan the face of the child, and it will and you can put in the child's name. And then the next time the child wants to play with with Cosmo, it will say you know in robotic uh, you know recording, hi shy. Um, so it actually recognizes the face, stores that in anonymous forms through some sort of jumbled uh, set of numbers, and then remembers it um, to uh, personalize and greet the child the next time they come. Most people won't be concerned about that, but Morris might be. Morris, you concerned? Well, about a little concerned, but I'm more interested. I mean, Anki is a really good example because Anki Drive is, for me, almost the epitome of we can do it, therefore we will. Um, 
I was foolish enough to buy Anki Drive for my children. It's terrible. I mean, I, it doesn't work. You might be and, watching this panel. You have to be um, and I don't, I don't mind telling them it's terrible because it is. <laughs> and I think that that's the interesting thing is that they've created this amazing piece of technology where these cars are controlled by your mobile phone. Um, they kind of map out the circuit that you are created and then you can leave bombs behind and you can fire and you can do all these incredible things. But both my children were bored within seconds because it would, didn't really work and also it just wasn't as good as scale trick. Are they boys? Uh, Are they boys? They're both boys, oh, yeah, okay. six and nine. So they're spack bang in the wheelhouse of who they're aiming it at. Okay. But the problem is, is it didn't work and it felt like a really good example of, hey, we've got a piece of technology which doesn't require the, the Luddite technology of old scale tricks. Um, so therefore, let's do it. And actually, you know, I would say, well, you know, Get it in front of kids. Have kids play with this thing because I can't imagine that they had so many kids play this thing and went, this is just amazing because it just it didn't quite work. And it's, I think that's a good example of technology for technology's sake. I have a tip for you, Morris. I think you should introduce your boys to Hello Barbie. <laughs> they would love Hello Barbie. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the truth is that my 12-year-old son, who's now 13, actually loves conversing with uh, Barbie just for, for kick's sake. Hi, um, my name is Steve. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Like exercise, you're talking to girls. My yeah, name. that's it's right. Like, <laughs> so you can have like these tutorials, you know, be, be sensitive, be courteous, be a gentleman. Right. You know, there's a, there's a law, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll use this as a segue to talk about some of the legalities in this area, but there's a law in the U.S. known as COPPA, and it's been mentioned here already in the past previous panels. But COPPA says that if you collect any personal data from kids, you need to give kids access, I'm sorry, you need to give their parents access to that data. And so in, in some of the cases that we've dis been describing here, uh, the companies are actually complying with the law by making available voice recordings back to the parent if they store it, uh, making it available to the parent to play back and hear what their kid is saying to Barbie. It might seem spooky, but it's actually a, a way of achieving compliance with uh, some legalities here in the U.S. So let's let's go into that. Let's talk about the potential concerns around privacy, security, and safety. Um, what are some of the regulations that, that we're concerned about? Um, any of you want to opine? I mean, obviously, this is something I can talk to as well, but um, what do you guys see as uh, sort of the big concerns from a, from a privacy standpoint? Let's start with you, uh, uh, Avishai. Well, I think today, um, and that's my only personal view, I don't think we fully understand what is privacy because the information that people today are willing and actively contributing through social networks and through payment uh, sites, willingly contributing their own IDs and, and, and credit cards and, and where they live and so on and so forth. And when my mother's cousin's daughter shared something very private uh she's 12 so you can imagine what she's going through in that age shared something very private on her instagram account and got about 300 likes i think we today don't fully understand what is privacy what is private and what people want to be kept private i think the new generation i uh, will present us with a new level of privacy uh something that the legislator will have to address of course um in the, in the personal view of, of, of Pix and I, while we are ICO certificate in the UK, which is probably one of the tightest uh, data regulators, uh, at least in Europe, I'm not sure that that would still suffice in about five or 10 years to the general market. Uh, since technology is advancing so fast, for example, what Pix and I does, uh, the legislator doesn't necessarily uh, know how to deal with it, and definitely not the people. Uh, this would require, and I think everybody should 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 call for that, for actually a tighter and a more open um, understanding of what privacy is, in order to really choose um, to keep the privacy that the, the user wants to keep. Because if they ask me what I want to share, I would say, I don't want to share anything. But the cost of free for every app that we download is giving it permission for our device ID, for our storage, and so on and so forth. This is what apps do. They use this information, hopefully within the regulation of the law and what the law allows it to do. 
and and this is some sort of exchange of what people are willing to give for free. <laughs> Avishai, how do you how do you communicate that to a user that they should feel comfortable about using your technology, especially when you're usually operating in the background, yes. right? You're not the actual app that, that the kid or the or the consumer is interacting with. You're working in the background. How do you communicate that? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, the only way that we work with uh, apps today is through the permission uh, for the user's uh, storage, which today exists in about 70, 80 percent of the apps today in the world. And I assure you, I don't work with uh, 80 percent of the apps. Um, with every client that we work with, we ask them to communicate the message of Pixanai to the client, meaning not necessarily just in, the, in their about page, but what is this app? Because the app is working with the user, what this app is making the client uh, do. Meaning, uh, you know, everybody not necessarily read the terms and conditions, but we do ask them to actively communicate the procedures that work in the background, such as Pix and I. Uh, not only we ask the client to uh, leave uh, the user, I'm sorry, to know that there is an opt-out out of our service, meaning they don't have to necessarily download the app. They can choose to opt out from our services working on in the background of, of, of the app without necessarily removing the app itself. And does that happen at the point of download or after download? Well, before you read, uh, there's a download. You know, there's a there's a brief of what the app does. Okay, the permissions. I can't tell my my publisher what to do with their description of the app. Right. But this is visible and reachable to any person that uh, chooses to do so. So you're sort of relying now on the permissions. Let's say for as part of the Google Play Store, right? When you first install an app, of course, it will list the permissions. And in your case, it might say access to storage, storage, and photo album. Yeah. This is uh, right. quite generic, yes. Right. But that could also be just taking pictures, not necessarily being scanned for sort of demographic Taking analysis. pictures would be camera. Camera, okay. So storage of photos. So that actually makes you think, if I don't work with 80% of the apps today, why do 80% of the apps today require storage. access to storage? Right. So something does happen and something does exist in the background. Right. And right. if people are willingly giving their, their personal information... Remember, what we do is non-personal information, so we communicate outside quite easily. Right, right. How many uh, people here actually read through the permissions when you install an app? Anybody? Oh, okay. we have one. One brave young lady. Um, anybody read the privacy terms? Lawyer in the front row didn't put her hand start up. Oh, <laughs> start forwarding it to Shy from now on. Shy, is this okay to download? No. Well, she does read them for her own company, at least. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, let's, uh, Asi, how about you? Um, what, what laws concern you? Um, and, uh, and let's get into how, how you're dealing with that. Well, can I disclose our uh, work, like things that we've discussed already? Sure. Okay. So basically, we came to Shy and KidSafe, um, and, you know, we're now working on really deeply understanding the elements. But the first off the bat, Shai said that one of the things I didn't mention before is that we ask for a photo. So you can upload a photo of, of the child. We, we, we originally asked for the name. We didn't say nickname. And uh, Shai said that's a problem because if the child uploads, or the parents in this case, upload a photo of the child, um, that's... That's not good because then, then the photo can be connected to the name, can be connected to the other elements and so forth. So he recommended that we find another solution, which in this case can be, let's say, an avatar or it can be maybe just like, you know, a picture of a boy, a picture of a girl, and you just choose one or maybe you choose out of a few, but it's not going to actually be the, the, the child's face. And then the other element was uh, you said the name. That's a problem. It should be a nickname. And then... And then, you know, even when you write a nickname, maybe the parent will put the full name. So you have to find a way to detect or to make it, you know, a very short nickname. So those are things that, you know, we were, we're still concerned about, you know, and we're working with you to, to kind of hone in on what's, what's ex you know, what's legal and what's not, what's compliant and what's not. 
So obviously the, the COPPA law will play into that and what data you can capture about kids and store. Um, there's some new laws in, the, in Europe coming into place with the General Data Protection Directive. Um, there are some biometric laws as well which might raise some concerns, especially when it comes to scanning photos um, and storing that. Um, obviously, I want to come back to you real quick, and, and then we'll move on to some security-related questions as well, because uh, Morris couldn't help but talk about the Hello Barbie breaches, where I, which actually weren't, weren't breaches. But, um, but we'll come back to that. And, uh, and, um, uh, but back to you, Avishai, real quick. Um, if I have my photo album being scanned, should I be concerned if I've got pictures of my friends on there? Well, since uh, all information that we store is anonymized, I don't necessarily know who is your friend. Or I don't know that it is a friend. I just know that it's another person that is in your vicinity. Uh, I don't have identifier about any person that other than the device itself. I don't necessarily know um, who the person is behind the device. I can tell maybe that it's a male or a female, but there's no way to tell who the person is, and thus ne necessarily can't tell anything about their, their peers. So I think the general theme that I, at least I'm taking away from, from this is that you know if you, if you keep data anonymous, yeah. right? the goal here is to anonymize the data, even if it appears to be sensitive, um, scramble it into a bunch of numbers, get rid of the actual source data, uh, and you should be in good shape. And the truth is that the law is pretty comfortable with that in some areas uh, in terms of anonymizing data. There is the creepiness factor, which uh, always has to be dealt with. Um, Morris, what do you think about about anonymizing data? Do you think that that uh, assuages the fears of consumers enough? <clears throat> yeah, I guess to a degree it does. But it's it's when I took out my first bank account, my bank manager told me about my overdraft, and he was very clear that this is um, this is a limit, not a target, um, and. <laughs> The same thing with um, my driving instructor when talking about speed limits. And I think that we're always very, very conscious of going as close as we can to copper. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, the regulations are there for a reason, that they're there to enable us to uh, have a level playing field and they're there to enable us to, to be a guide. But, you know, we, we're kind of living in this very Orwellian society, but rather than it being dictated on us, um, we're opting into it. Um, so I think that, that, that we, particularly in the kids and family space, you know, we have such a moral responsibility to think, is this information necessary? Is it truly, truly important for the purpose of what I'm trying to achieve for it to happen? Um, and I think often we can just overlook that and we can kind of go, well, it's fine because it doesn't technically breach any regulations. Therefore, it's OK. You know, and, and in Europe, you know, our angle and, and many more progressive or not necessarily progressive, but maybe more uh, security conscious companies will will have the line of if this isn't absolutely 100 percent necessary, then just we don't have it. And we don't need it. So I just think that we need to be very careful of 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 the amount of information that we're capturing of people um, and of their privacy um, and what we are enabling people to do. You know, we talk about a twelve-year-old on 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 Instagram. You know, and we have a moral responsibility as society to understand that she might not be able to make the right decisions of her on her own privacy. You know, I think Will Smith had a great statement about his son, and he said, "I used to be an." an idiot just as much as my son is but thankfully I didn't have the ability to share it with the world you know and I think that you know we do you know we need to be aware that that this is a talking about kids and family and that we are heavily regulated but we also have an enormous social moral and ethical responsibility to do the right thing and, and assuming a company does or assuming they want to push the envelope a bit do you think transparency and, and communicating clearly what they're doing and how they're doing it and getting the consumer buying, do you think that that's a sufficient approach and reasonable approach to dealing with these issues? It's a great first step, you know, and, and anything that, that covers up what you're trying to do is obviously bad. Um, but in, in many respects, we know, you know, kids don't even read the instructions on the game they're about to play, you know, and, and, and adults are exactly the same. We don't read anything. So, yes, there is a sense of transparency, but how transparent do we need to be before you know 
people aren't just just aren't engaged in that conversation so you know yes transparency absolutely honesty absolutely making sure that it's very very crystal clear what it is that you're doing and for what purpose is really important but at the same time don't use that as an excuse for bad behavior got it okay so we've got privacy um, in the sense of anonymizing data minimizing data collection where you can uh, we've got transparency uh, clear disclosures uh, and then really the third you know key challenge to deal with when it comes to controversial technology for kids uh, especially connected devices and connected toys uh, is security um, how do you keep the data secure and and for this I want to loop back to you Asi um, with the Galulu bottle uh, which is a, a connected device right it's connected to the yep. internet via Wi-Fi 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 um, how, how do you prevent snooping? Um, do you even care if people are snooping uh, about what kids have in that bottle and how much they're drinking? I, I want to I wanna just add one element here that I think is important for the audience. I mean, how many of you are have lived or have been in America? Can you raise your hand? Okay. And are there a lot of Israelis here? Israelis? Okay. So just for the Israelis, because I, I grew up half my life in America. In America, there's a big problem with pedophiles. And actually, there's a there's like a mapping of your area. You go online. There's like a website, governmental, that's publicly, people can see it. Like my family there knows where the pedophiles live, the ones that are actually recorded as having offensive. I see. Uh, how, how many do you have nearby your house? In my house? Oh, I live in Tel Aviv. Near, now. Nearby, nearby. In in Los Angeles? Yeah. Near my family, there's a. Uh, uh, Las Feliz area and uh, oh, Echo Park. There's That's there's a lot. That's creepy. That's not far from where I live. That's there's a lot actually. Okay. So they know, you know. So so basically, you know, why this is so important and why it's so scrutin um, in certain countries. I actually don't know in Israel how how scrutin it is, but in America there is a lot of issues with that because if 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 a pedophile and today you know a lot of people can hack hacks into this info, it could potentially be a problem. So for us, you know, I'll tell you something. Since we're not doing GPS shy, um, I feel that it's a little less of an issue um, because in an ideal world, what I would love to have is that, you know, because I do believe that, you know, look at, you look at Hillary Clinton, look what's going on with WikiLeaks. So like, at the end of the day, if somebody wants to hack and he's really good at, at hacking, he'll probably be able to hack. So what I would want to have for us is a situation where he goes and hacks and what he finds is nothing that can actually give him anything. Like he'll see a nickname, he'll see an you know, some you know, image of a of a gender, and then he'll see how much the child weighs, and maybe you can see his water intake. And that, for me, is not enough for him to actually go ahead and, you know... Cause damage. Yeah. Right. So your approach is, you know, don't have the data, sensitive data in the first place, so that in the event it does get hacked, there's nothing too sensitive that's getting released. Yeah, and, and, and if I go further and we're getting into, you know, our, our um, you know, uh, down our roadmap, we're going to do more products and we want to, you know, build an ecosystem for a child... Um, social network we're just you know this is a start where they shake and they, and they engage and then it records it pre-cell phone so down the line we want to do more products and we, you know then um, there will definitely be some sensitive maybe information so how I, w I would want to approach that I mean obviously with your guidance is more like Avishai said is like I would encrypt it in a way that cannot you know connect Hopefully, hopefully, that data to a specific, you know, user or, a, you know, maybe encrypted in a code where, you know, like you said, the pictures are not, you know, are, are encrypted. So it's like, yeah. it's, it's a number. I don't know that this actual thing belongs to, for example, my friend Ari. You know, I can't, I can't know that. But if I'm a super brilliant hacker, maybe I can. So, you know, maybe there's some more measures that will need to be taken, like, you know, what you what you said, that down the line, like, we're not going to know how far this can go. So it's kind of like a dual-edged sword, because, you know, you're trying to protect, but at the same time, we're also advancing on both fronts, right? We're advancing with 
what we need to protect, because the more we can do, the more protection there will need to be. But on the other hand, the side that's potentially a predator or creepers, which are there, Twitter, for example, you know, having a hard time selling because a quarter of their users are creepers. It's an it's a fact. So how do you how do you you know how do you protect that? No? Okay, it's so we're, we're, at, we're out of time um, and we need to move to questions. But I I sort of want to open up the question uh, forum <clears throat> with a, a bit of a phil philosophical question, uh, and that is the following: um, We we have many kids. Uh, companies and web technologies and web companies for that matter starting to offer uh, more cutting edge um, stuff to, to kids and families. And a lot of times they get the brunt from regulators, oh you're terrible for collecting voice recordings from children or you're terrible for tracking water consumption from children or Avishai you're, you're a devil for, uh, for scanning people's photo albums. Um, but the reality is, what's the alternative? Think about what's the alternative. If we don't offer engaging and interact interactive content for kids, the alternative is for them to be on YouTube, uh, where there are mil millions upon millions of children um, potentially seeing inappropriate content. Um, they're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram, which is not supposed to be for those under 13. So it's my view that we should be embracing uh, some of the new cutting edge stuff for kids so that there is a viable alternative to keep them engaged with uh, content and, and activities that are meant for them. Because the alternative is much worse. And they're already engaged with the alternative. Um, so to the credit of this panel, um, and I'll let you comment on that and then open it up for anyone else. That actually goes back to um, what I've uh, stated before. While technology progresses on the cutting edge, uh, I always say it's, it's up to the legislator to keep track with the progress of the technology. Uh, on, on my aspect uh, specifically, um, while talking with clients, I've been told that the German federal protection law is probably the tightest one uh, in the world. Uh, the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. And this is something... All right. Danke. I think that's something... And that's something that we're undergoing right now. It's, up to, it's re quite the responsibility of, of, the, com of the company to go through all the proper auditing and regulations that exist today. But it doesn't mean that that has to stop. The auditing and regulations need to be updated along with technologies. I Any just wanted to say, das ist gut. Das ist gut. So he's doing pretty good for a broken leg. Um, fellow in the back from Azumi. Yeah, I just had kind of a question because <clears throat> we're talking about a lot of products that are for the general public, but they're being used by families and kids. And often, you know, for example, with privacy settings, you go in and you get, not always, but sometimes you go in and you get prompted to set, prompted to set those up. Should it be the other way, other way around where you have privacy settings from the start and you have to opt out so that we're forcing, you know, those products or, or regulators might ask those products to start with the most security settings and then ask families or people that are in the general public to opt out of it. Well, that be you guys way? are welcome to comment. I mean, my, my thoughts on that topic is the, pr the problem is that, that most parents typically, and, and even children, won't go back and change their settings. And so the fear is that if you, uh, if you put that up front, uh, they may ignore it. Um, you may have the most secure default settings, but then the user experience may not it may not be as enjoyable, right? So it compromises the user experience. Um, that could be true in the case of a chat setting, for example. If you turn chat setting to be menu chat or safe chat, well, then it won't be a very engaging experience for children. Um, so that's the challenge, certainly, that I've seen uh, in that respect. I have right. to say one thing that, you know, the, when you talk about that, almost every app that I have including obviously Facebook and even the iOS system itself, asks you along the way. And every time you update, there's like a message that asks you if you allow it, you know, to send information back. And if you're allowed to work in the background. At least on iOS, right? On yeah. iOS at least. And s on certain apps, you know, so, I mean, but that could be like a, there's a flow to it. There's an experience. And if you do it right, 
then you can ask, but you got to do it in a smart way. But I agree with Shai. If you do it up front, most people are going to use the default. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, uh, thank the panel for uh, the conversation. <laughs>